At the end of 1998, developer Naughty Dog was at a crossroads, wanting to develop for the new and upcoming PlayStation 2, with their three-year contract having ended with Universal Interactive Studios, who own the rights to the Crash Bandicoot series, they set their sights on Project Y. But with half the development team still eager to produce one last Crash game, and with their obsession over Mario Kart at an all-time high at the office, half of Naughty Dog set to work on a little title we all know as Crash Team Racing. We thought players would appreciate something different than Crash 4 for the PlayStation. So we did what we had done well with Crash. The PlayStation had no good kart game, so we made one. Jason Rubin. Kart racers were plentiful in the 90s, with the likes of Bomberman Fantasy Race, Toy Story Kart, Muppets Kart Mania, and, uh, and uh, notably Diddy Kong Racing, all trying to compete with Mario Kart and the then successful Mario Kart 64. Diddy Kong Racing provided a story where the characters from the developer Rare's worlds would race against one another in a story mode, racing in manic boss fights and providing an entertaining world map that linked the races together. By the time Naughty Dog finished working on the three titles it had contracted to do with Universal, Crash 1-3, we were determined to get fair compensation for the work we were putting into the titles. So Naughty Dog contracted with Sony directly after our contract with Universal was done. We agreed to make a racing game. For a while it wasn't going to be a Crash title, but we agreed that if Universal would take a reasonable cut in the royalty on the game so that Naughty Dog would be paid fairly for the work it was doing, then we would do one last Crash title Ruben states. And so, Crash Team Racing was born, incorporating all the elements that made Mario Kart 64 and Diddy Kong Racing successful. Whether intentional or not, Crash Team Racing also contains a world map which linked races together in its adventure mode, allowing a single player experience of one of the eight starting characters to traverse a hub. Portals would then take them to a race and once obtaining the track's trophy, players would go back and earn relics, much like Crash Bandicoot Warped, or CTR tokens where players would jump across pits and slightly difficult sections on the track to gain the three letters C, T and R before driving first across the finish line. Throughout the hub, players would also participate in boss races, where familiar characters such as Ripperoo, Papu Papu and Pinstripe returned from Crash 1, as well as Komodo Joe on his lonesome from Crash 2. Don't worry, Mo was represented by a Resaurus figure, so they both got their limelight in one way. Speaking of adventure mode, a new villain by the name of Nitrous Oxide was created to set the wheels in motion, as Jason had the idea of four legs, our Japanese producers had the idea of the very racer helmet-like design, several American producers has had the feedback of the dreads coming up the sides of the helmet, it was a very good mix of all the input to create nitrous oxide, Bob Rafai of Naughty Dog stated. And so the story is thus, crabby alien N-Oxide one day turns up to Earth, concocting a devious game to race for the planet as part of his intergalactic scheme to turn planets into parking lots and transforming the inhabitants into slaves. Interpol, world governments and every other human is entirely unfazed, seriously, leaving Crash Cortex and Shums to take up the challenge and save the planet for themselves. It's a simple setup that gets the adventure mode going, racing against Enoxide as the final boss of his crazy spaceship. A fully fledged story mode for a kart racer was rare for the time, but it wasn't the story that burnt rubber into our souls and warmed our hearts as players. It was the gameplay. CTR lifted all the successful elements of Diddy Kong Racing and Mario Kart and built upon them. Evan Wells of Naughty Dog even states that the team developed the entirety of Diddy Kong's Crescent Island as a test before CTR's solid development began. In fact, CTR built upon these other kart racers' gameplay, allowing more in-depth to the gameplay and boost mechanics. Dan Array came up with the slide and hang time turbo system. I still love that invention, Ruben states. The first of these was the hang time turbo, of course, in which jumping from a road bump or height would produce a boost in speed once the kart landed. The higher the jump, the larger the boost. This provided more tactical ways of playing and trying to maximise the track's layout. The second of these was a power slide, implemented by holding R1 and the direction to slide, and then pressing the L1 button once the cart's exhaust turned black. After three successful attempts, the power slide gorge would reset. The key from becoming a novice to an expert lay in mastering these techniques. Many items were uplifted and converted from Super Mario Kart with a much larger Crash series presence. Green Cooper shells became the bowling bombs from Crash Warp's pirate levels, red shells became Engine's missiles from his boss fights, and the banana pills from <laughs> Diddy Kong Racing became nitrous beakers from Crash 1. In addition to this, TNT crates were added as layable hazards, leading players to jump repeatedly or be succumbed to an 
explosion, and the crash warp vortex replaced the blue spiny shell, homing in on whoever was in first place. All of this and more, as Wampa Fruit provided a powerful version of each one of these power-ups, meaning 10 Wampa Fruit would make players even more deadly in a race. TNTs became the instantly explosive nitro crates from the series. Brio beakers would have an additional effect, such as slowing carts down, causing them to jump around or change their weapon, or even the warp vortex would become a homing void for every cart in front of the player. Even magical masks Aku Aku and Uka Uka provided shields for their respective character alliances on the track, as well as providing helpful hints in adventure mode. Strangely, the team aspect in Crash Team Racing is absent in all but the multiplayer battle mode. With a second controller or even a multi-tap, up to four players can race across any of the tracks or battle it out in special battle arenas, where hitting the opposition awards points. The weapons could even be toggled with special invisibility and a much longer boost item being only available in this mode. This feature offered an expansive and fun experience for the game, extending its lifespan significantly. Other competitive features which extended the game's length is the time trial mode. And by this, I don't mean the relic race mode. I mean racing around the track without any time crates to freeze the clock. If players beat the high score of that particular track, they will be treated to Dr. Nefarious Trophy, challenging them to a race against his ghost. If they beat this, then they will be able to challenge N Oxide's time on the track. If the player manages to beat all of N Trophy's times, they will be rewarded with N Trophy as a playable character. Unfortunately, doing the same will not issue Oxide as a reward, but fear not, as the lovable Penta Penguin is unlockable in his place through holding the L1 and R1 at the main menu and pressing down, right triangle, down, left triangle, and up. In the PAL version of the game, Penta has the best stats in speed, acceleration, and turning, meaning him an ideal character to race against Oxide's ghosts. When asking why Oxide wasn't made playable in CTR, Andy Gavin responded with, We only had room for so many, and the consensus, particularly in the Japanese, was that the cute characters were better choices, like the Polar Bear Cup. CTR would not only be Naughty Dog's last Crash game, but also Josh Mansell's last Crash soundtrack and Brendan O'Brien's last reprisal of voicing many of the main characters, including Pinstripe, Tiny, Engine, and Papu Papu, amongst others. But what CTR left was a legacy, and positive reviews. Doug Perry of IGN stated that despite being a reformed clone of Mario Kart and Diddy Kong Racing, that once you get past the insanely capitalistic smile of Crash, the game is rock solid in playability and graphics. Hell, it's a four-player car game that's on the PlayStation, isn't that enough? And the racing community responded positively, with Cat Sabus from The Escapist happily stating that CTR is a classic and not just for the console it was released for. CTR was a pinnacle of humour, racing complexity, strategy and of course, multiplayer. And it doesn't end there. If you ask me, CTR was the best game Naughty Dog ever made on a sheer playability level. I think it was a great success, states Ruby. And many players agree. Due to the success and popularity of CTR, demand for the next-gen sequel was high. In an interview for PlayStation Power in 2001, Rubin was asked whether a sequel to the successful CTR would ever rev into action. Rubin jokingly replied with, Would you like to see one? Answers on the back of a postcard, please. So it isn't surprising that come 2003, developer Vicarious Visions had a go at the gas pedal, creating Crash Nitro Kart, the spiritual sequel to CTR. Crash Nitro Kart had everything that made CTR a success, from the power sliding to the multiplayer arena modes, even expanding upon them with capture the flag and crystal collecting modes. It had everything but the speed of its predecessor. A turbocharged extravaganza it certainly wasn't, more like a mobility scooter charge Sunday afternoon. Fans were critical, however Nitro Kart built on the original in many ways, offering at last a team styled gameplay structure that was absent in CTR in all but the battle arenas. I'll probably quote the developer at this point uh, regarding the team structure, but getting quotes from Vicarious Visions is like convincing Activision to pick up the Crash series again. It's difficult, so uh, on with the show. Newer characters such as Crunch and Entrance were placed in cards, whilst old favourites such as Ripperoo and Pinstripe were absent. Nitrous Oxide returned, but his name spelt wrong, along with two random Gasminoxians from his home planet, whilst Entrance headed a team of his own, brainwashed characters from Crash Games past. Crash headed Team Bandicoot and Cortex headed his own team of faithful henchmen. Both teams of which could be played in the game's adventure mode, which expanded upon the game's story. Taking the crabby Oxide up a notch and introducing the intergalactic racing champion Emperor Velo the 27th. Yeah, his name is French for bicycle. It's your Thanks for that. The story was that Velo forced Crash and Cortex to race against his team of cronies, headed by Entrance and Oxide, in an intergalactic circuit, all planets. Each planet contained a different champion, a boss character to be raced against for their key. 
Once the four keys were obtained, players would race against the champion of the entire competition, Velo himself. The boss characters were well designed, with Crunk mirroring Papu Papu on the alternate Earth and Terra, Cyborg Shark Nash with a case of ADHD, Norm being able to split into one trash talking builder like Guy in one silent mind, and Gary being a cleaning neurotic robot. Who designed these characters? Well, Charles M. Billis, of course, back from the character designing for Naughty Dog's Crash Games. The team at Vicarious Visions tracked down Charles, and then he brought me on in Nitro Car. That was a great reunion, stated Joe Peterson, also brought back to design some of the tracks and cinematics. That's right. Crash, Nitro Cult, for the first time in the series, dealt with cinematic cutscenes, pre-production by Epoch Inc, handled by Joe Pearson and Co, and the final result commissioned with Red Eye Studios. This time around, I was able to direct, design, and storyboard 40 minutes of game cinematics in addition to doing much of the key background designs. It was fun being able to plug in some of my original elements, like the castle and the interiors of Smell Joe. And I made to Thomas Happ noted, there was a lot of scenes where the characters are just standing around with some depth within their talk and we had to invent ways to personalise their manners. This made the cutscenes much more entertaining and brought alive the characters in more visual ways. Charles recalled happy memories too, stating that I liked Emperor Velo, which was another character I designed. The series would feature the same style of cutscenes with the next two Crash games, both by different developers. As such, various Nitro Kart tracks were similar in design to CTRs, possibly from either Joe Pearson's influence or from my vicarious vision's inability to do something entirely different. This would become a theme with their games. Tracks such as Clockwork Wampa bore similarity to CTR's Cortex Castle, while tracks like Assembly Lane ripped Engine Labs and Tiny Arena right out of the original kart racer, fusing them into one. Nitro Kart bore other similarities to CTR, with its weapons primarily staying the same, from the bowling bombs to the TNT crates. Various weapons changed, however, with Nitro Speakers becoming Ice Mines and Static Mines, both of which had zero relevance to the series before it. Ashif Hakik and Todd Maston, of Wim Music, composed the game's somewhat ambient music, being lost to the screeching sound effects of sliding and the obnoxious jumping sounds throughout the race. Give these a listen separately to the game, or adjust the volume. The music tracks actually aren't that bad, but are lost in the game to other noises. In fact, Universal Interactive were that happy with the soundtrack that four tracks were remixed and released in a special soundtrack disc when purchased at particular retailers. And it must be noted that Nitro Kart was the last of Clancy Brown's roles as Cortex. Yes, all good things must come to an end. And whilst many Crash players will quote Clancy's Cortex as their favourite, really, I'd have to say his best role was in Crash 2, with his voice becoming much higher and slightly more camp, particularly in his post-Naughty Dog Crash games. So much so, in fact, that when the next Cortex voice actor played the part, the transition wasn't that noticeable. But more on that in the future! Reception of Nitro Kart was mixed. Most players praised the Game Boy Advance version of the game, stating that it would be a close contender for best kart racer on the handheld, Craig Harris of IGN stated. The GBA title even had the boss characters as racers and, of course, Spyro the Dragon retaining that franchise link with that purple dragon. Ed Lewis of IGN also stated that the graphics for the single player mode were bright, cheery and smooth, but decreased in quality in the multiplayer modes, which was something both CTR and CNK did to compensate for more human players than usual. Meanwhile, Nintendo World Report loved that sexy talking mask, known as Aku Aku, who appears to give hints in adventure mode. And just when you thought it was all over, the kart racers spawned a phenomenon of mobile clones and sequels, starting with Crash Nitro Kart for the mobile, which looks and plays 10 times worse than the GBA title. Then there was Crash Nitro Kart 2, which wasn't much better. Then Crash Bandicoot Nitro Kart 3D, the first of the mobile titles to incorporate 3D models into the game and actual kart racing, complete with weapons that the prequels had none of. Even Ripper Ruin, Oxide make an appearance in somewhat weird designs. Oh, and Yaya Panda, that memorable character from nothing before. Okay. And finally, Crash Bandicoot Nitro Kart 2 was created to help us players get confused of all of those titles and think we're playing the same game. This title was by far the best racer on the mobile, winning itself awards as the most downloaded title for the iOS. Ripper was back, looking like his Crash 2 Jekyll and Mr. Hyde incarnation, and as was Yaya Panda. Everyone retained more mid-series designs, and weapons such as holes kept players on their toes, whilst incorporating bowling bombs in the form of Key Blast from Dragon Ball Z. Of course, have fun with the kart racers, there's one more console racer to go, 
but we won't be looking at that at this time. The reason will become apparent in the future. Speaking of the future, join me next time as we look at what happens to the Crash franchise when Traveller's Tales get their mitts on some treasure, and everyone wants a piece of that pie.